Today, we're going to be in Acts chapter 4. I've titled the message, The Barnabas Test. The Barnabas Test, okay? So if you're there in Acts chapter 4, we'll be in verse 32. If you're there this morning, say amen. Amen. Awesome. Let's start reading together. The Bible says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and of one soul. This unity, guys, that church was unified. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but that, uh, but they had, excuse me, all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. We know it's the grace of God, you know, working in them. Verse 34, nor was there anyone among them who lacked For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. The church in Acts was on fire. If you read the book of Acts, we see how the church should operate. God's spirit was moving in a mighty way in their midst. They had seen days where there were 3,000 saved after one sermon. In Acts chapter 4, where we pick it up today, uh, Peter had just preached another sermon. God fell upon the the sermon, and there were 5,000 who had trusted Christ that day, and the church was booming. In those days when someone came to know Christ, it cost them almost everything. They would lose their job. Families would disown them, and there was, uh, of course, great needs that came with the, the great multitude God was building there at Jerusalem. And, of course, a church that is growing always will have need of servants. And as we come to Acts chapter 4, we're introduced to one of God's choice servants by the name of Joseph, or Joseph. Joseph, we don't get to know too much about his past. And may I say this, when you come into the family of God, uh, God isn't too concerned with your past. Uh, He's concerned with you moving forward. And and, uh, so Joseph, he got into the body of Christ, and right away, he began to find his place. He began to use his gifts to honor God in the body. I want you to understand this morning, if you're saved, God has gifted you specifically for the work of the church, of the body. And he's put you into this local church for a purpose, not just to come sit week after week and observe and be a spectator, but he has a plan to use you. Barnabas understood this, and he began right away. We don't know much about him, but the simple fact that he was from a city called Cyprus and he was from the line of the priests, he was a Levite. But we know this about him. He was an encourager. He encouraged those people in the church. And I want us this morning to learn from his life, learn from his ministry, and ask ourselves these questions this morning as we take the Barnabas test. I want you to listen to this very first question Are we consistently serving the body of Christ? Are we consistently serving the body of Christ? Barnabas did. Now, he had gotten a nickname, of course, from the leaders in the church, the apostles, the son of encouragement. Every time they got together, which in the early church they got together four, five, six, seven times a week, Barnabas was encouraging somebody. He was looking for somebody who maybe was going through a trial or a health trial or something, had them downtrodden. And Barnabas took the time to pull them aside and encourage them some way, somehow. And this was his ministry. This was his unofficial ministry that he took upon himself to serve the Lord Jesus in this way. Let me ask you this question this morning. How do you serve the Lord Jesus in the body? Do you have a specific way that God has wired you and has given you the ability to encourage people? Uh, have, you, have you done, uh, have you sought that out? Have you sought where you fit into the body? Barnabas, he did. He was always 
in church to contribute. I want you to understand something, guys. We are the church. This morning, you might have told your kids, hey, let's get up and let's go to church. Uh, but let me explain it to you. I'm going to teach this to my kids. We are the church. This is just a building. And when we come together, we gather together around, of course, our faith in Jesus, our Lord. Uh, but let me tell you something this morning. When you go home, when you're in your house, when you're at work, you're still the church. And some of us, we must get to the realization that now we are a part of a family that is bigger than just our immediate family. We're a part of the body. And I believe this is what Joseph uh, or Barnabas understood. He understood that he had a ministry. I, uh, a few weeks ago, I was calling through uh, the, child, the children's uh, ministry list and parents and contacting them and, and just uh, asking them for feedback and, you know, just to uh, formally introduce myself to some parents who I, I couldn't put a, a face to the name. And, and I got to one call and I called and the, the young man answered and I began to ask him uh, what he thought about our ministry here, the children's ministry and any way we can improve. And he, he just said he loved it and that uh, it's been a blessing to his family. And he began to explain to me that he himself and his wife, they, they didn't have any children, but they brought uh, his, his, his niece and nephew, I believe, each week. And uh, he began to share with me how the, his niece and nephew had recently lost their father this year. And how this little girl in particular was having a rough time with this. And how she would have nightmares and, and how she would struggle uh, just the fact of her father no longer being here. And, and he began to go on and, and tell me how since she's been coming to this church, since she's been going over to the, the building across the way and hearing about Jesus and being encouraged uh, here at church, uh, she's doing much better. She sleeps every night with her Bible, he told me, and he, uh, he shared this with me, and I'm sitting at the desk over there in that building just, just crying, you know, trying to keep it together because I had no idea that this little girl, maybe five years old, was carrying that. And you don't know what the person next to you in the very pew was carrying this morning when they came in. But God has called you to be a part of a family, and so that when you come here, it's not all about you. It's about who can you serve today. And Barnabas understood this. Barnabas understood that he was a part of a family, the family of God, a local church, and that he had a role in that church. He consistently served to the point where they had to give that man a new name. Would be to God that we would have some more Barnabases here. We have some, and I'm, I'm encouraging those who are uh, consistently serving. We have some of God's choicest servants in this church, and you're faithful week after week to serve, and I just want to commend you. God is seeing that. He is taking note of that, and there is a blessing for you. There is a blessing for those who serve in this life and in the next, and, and Barnabas understood the privilege it is to serve within the local church. Are we consistently serving the body of Christ? That's the first question of the Barnabas test. Now, question number two, are we contributors or are we consumers? Look at what Barnabas is doing right away. When we introduced to him, look at verse 36, Acts chapter 4. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated the son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Right away, we see uh, Barnabas contributing. In, in, in this case, he's, of course, contributing through the uh, financial gain, but it's not always this way that we contribute. But uh, this is what the Bible highlights. It highlights that uh, even though uh, he could have kept this for himself and he could have uh, or, or sold it and kept the proceeds for himself, he saw needs within the body. He saw people who were no longer able to go to work because they came to know Christ and they had needs. And, and he said, I'm not just going to sit here and not contribute to that. I'm going to be a part of what God is doing in Jerusalem. Are, are we contributing? Are we consumers? Now, don't get me wrong. Everyone in here, we are all uh, consumers to some extent in this church. We, we all 
benefit from what God is doing here. Amen? Uh, we all uh, are privileged to, to call this church our home. And, but there are some among us who uh, are primarily consumers only. You come right before the service starts. You take your children to nursery. We love that. Take them there. And the children's ministry, uh, you come into church and you worship with us. And you get the kids and you go home. And that's the extent of, of your involvement at this church. And I love you. And we want you here. But this, that's not what God intended for uh, us to be in the church. He intended for every one of us to have a place where we contribute. And it's not just financially, it's, it's with our time, with our talent. Some of you in here are talented, are, excuse me, talented beyond uh, uh, my, uh, my, my capabilities and other capabilities. And, and God has given you a gift so that you can exercise it amongst the body, but you've just hid that treasure, that talent. You remember that parable? where Jesus uh, told the story of the, how the master gave talents to his, uh, his servants, and they were to take those talents and to multiply those and to use them for the uh, advancement of the master's business. Did you guys understand that this thing, that the local New, Tres- New Testament church, is the master's business? This is God's work here. And he's giving you a part in it. The moment you trusted Christ as a Savior, you are added to this, uh, this, uh, this body. And so this morning, we have to ask ourselves this question and, and, and just be honest with ourselves. Do I contribute or am I just a consumer? There's, you're missing out on the blessing. You're missing out on the privilege to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's, 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 it's really, uh, I've learned this, and, and those of you who serve can probably say the same thing. When I end up serving, I'm the one who gets the most blessing out of it. When I'm generous towards God, I'm the one who is blessed for it. I am the one who uh, gets to uh, have that, uh, that assurance, that, that just the, the uh, fulfillment that I am doing what God has called me to do. And I would say many Christians are depressed. Many Christians don't live out, uh, don't, don't have the joy in the Christian life because of this issue right here. The Dead Sea over in the Middle East, it has only inlets to it, right? And so because it has no outlet, nothing can live in the Dead Sea. Nothing. If you go over to the Dead Sea, it's so, the salt content is so high that you can float in there. You, you will not sink to the bottom. I mean, it, it's, but no fish, no plant life can survive in it. And this is the case from some Christians. They are constantly getting and getting and getting and never giving and never giving. And it's become stagnant. This morning, is worship stagnant? It's Bible reading and, and, and you know, God and, 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 and it's prayer and all these other essential things in the Christian life stagnant. You have no desire to serve. It may be because you haven't taken that step to get out of your comfort zone and to serve God. There's a place for you to serve. And it's here, the local church. Barnabas understood this, and I think the reason why Barnabas had so much joy and why he was such an encouragement to everyone he was around, because he realized this very truth that he was to be an, a contributor. He was a part of a family. If you read the next chapter, Acts chapter 4, though, we see kind of the opposite of it. We see Ananias and Sapphira. They were all about them receiving glory. They were all about what they could get. So they sold a property, but they kept back part of it, and they lied about it to, to the church leaders. And, of course, God was not pleased that church was a holy church on fire. Everyone was uh, having the grace of God working through them, and here comes these two who are going to try to sabotage that from the inside out. I've learned this. When there's a good work going on, when the grace of God is going on in the church, It's very rarely from without that the church receives attack. It's more so from within. And so let us realize, 
that we are called to be contributors. Y'all with me this morning? Getting kind of quiet in here. (laughs) Amen. But I understand. It convicted me too. (laughs) All right. Question number three. Who are we discipling? Who are we bringing in to the fold? Who are we pouring our lives into? I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. Barnabas always had someone he was discipling. Verse 26, Acts 9. The Bible says, and when Saul had come to Jerusalem, let me give a little background. Acts chapter 9, we know uh, the Saul, the persecutor of the church, the one who was responsible for over 2,000 deaths of Christians and imprisoned many others. He had been saved. He had been gloriously saved on the road to Damascus. And God called a man by the name of Ananias to come and meet Saul and to bring him in and to lay his hands on him so he could receive his sight back and, and to feed him and, and to kind of help him get along on his Christian journey. And time had went, Paul, uh, Saul, excuse me, preached boldly the name of Jesus in Damascus in the areas surrounding that. Of course, every time a man or a woman preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ unapologetically, there comes persecution. And that happened to Saul, and they were plotting to kill him. And so they, he had to flee from Damascus, and so he comes to Jerusalem. Remember who he was in his past life. He was the main persecutor of the church. He was there the day Stephen was stoned, and they laid Stephen's garments at his feet. He was the, the leading uh, uh, person in that persecution. And so he comes to Jerusalem, and this is what happens. The Bible says, and Saul had come to Jerusalem, and he tried to join the disciples. <laughs> Picture this. He's trying to go to church. <laughs> Did you imagine that? This is the reception. But they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. So they did not believe. This is just another one of your tactics, Saul, to get in, infiltrate us, find out all our going ins and coming out so you can kill more of us and imprison uh, the rest. I remember when you killed my aunt or my uncle or my daddy. I mean, could you imagine going back a place where you put people to death and and now you're going to join with them? This is not well received except for with one person. Who? But Barnabas <laughs> took him. Oh, it would be to God we would be like Barnabas, be willing to risk our very necks so that someone could come into fellowship. But Barnabas took him. He said, I, I, I'll take you, Barnabas. I mean, uh, Saul. And look, look, look what he does. And brought him to the apostles. So he, he says, Fooly with all these others, let's go straight to the leaders. <laughs> I'm going to take you to the apostles. And um, they took him, and Barney, I can only imagine what old Barney said. He said, hey, guys, <laughs> this guy saw, we know who he was in the past, but he knows Jesus now, and now he's a part of our family. And he's a mighty preacher. God's hand is on him, and I give my personal seal of approval on this man. And that held weight, right? Because who he was and how he served. And the apostles knew who he was. And so history tells us, the Bible tells us that he was there. They accepted him. And then Paul began to tell about how he preached the Lord. He had met the Lord on the road to Damascus and how uh, he had preached boldly in Damascus. And and then uh, he says, uh, and then the Bible says, so he was with them at Jerusalem. So now he's in. He's a part of it. And he's in with Barnabas. And the Bible says that he's with Barnabas coming in and going out. When you saw Paul, uh, uh, Barnabas, you saw Saul. He was attached to the hip with Barnabas. He was pouring into this young new convert. And who are you pouring into this morning? Do you have anyone who spiritually you are uh, hazarding yourself, pouring your time, effort, prayers, uh, uh, discipling them? If not, 
We're not doing what the Bible says. God says to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, see them baptized, and then disciple them. Disciple them. That's the hard work. Discipling. Uh, Spending the countless hours at your coffee table, sharing the word of God with them, praying with them when they fall, picking them back up, say, hey, it's okay, Saul. I know you lost your temper and you almost put that guy into prison, uh, but you'll do better next time. I'm, I'm with you. I'm still for you. Do you remember what it was like when you first got saved and you had that hunger and thirst for the word of God, but you just, you were reading, but you didn't know everything and what it meant, but you needed someone to show you? I remember it. I remember the day when I turned my life uh, back over to Christ, uh, I was going to a church and, and um, all my friends in the world, when I stopped going to the clubs with them and partying with them, they didn't want to have anything to do with me. That was all I guess we had in common. And so I was thirsty for godly friends. I needed friends. And so I remember going into church and a young man, 20, 21 years old, and I saw a young man, he was just standing there and he had a suit on and he had his Bible. I looked at him and I said, this, that guy looks like he knows where he's going. I need a friend who's going to help me. You see, I had just thrown away all my bad CDs and, you know, uh, I just totally said, no, I'm following you, Jesus. And I remember seeing my, he's my friend. I talked to him this week. His name is Brandon. And uh, he was a Marine. I have a special place in my heart for Marines. And I went up to him, and I introduced myself to him. I said, hey, my name is Abram, and I had my earring, both my earrings in. I was wearing something baggy, you know, like it was, <laughs> I just went up to him and said, hey, my name is Abram. Um, can I sit next to you? And uh, that was, he was like, oh, yeah, man, sure, you know. And needless to say, after that, he began to bring me in. He, began, he was coming to the Bible college where I was at, and, and he, he brought me to his dorm room, and I began to hang out with them instead of going to the clubs. I began to sit around with those kids as they prayed and as they studied their Bibles, and these kids all had callings on their lives. They knew they were going to go to mission fields and be pastors, and, and I didn't know what God had for me, and, but these guys allowed me to come in even though I looked different, even though I acted different, even though every now and then I might have slipped up and said a cuss word, but they didn't care. They were going to show me grace until I got to where God wanted me, and what we need today in our Christianity is men and women just like that, like my friend Brandon who say, hey, I'll take you where you're at. That's what we need. That's who Barnabas was. Who are we pouring into? Who are we, who are we discipling? If we aren't, then we're not passing the Barnabas test. Barnabas, he was constantly pouring into someone. I want you to see it again in Acts chapter 11. Eleven verse nineteen. So word had gotten back to the church of Jerusalem that not only Jews were getting saved, but now Gentiles. And they weren't too sure about it. So who do they send? They send good old Barnabas to just to verify it. Is this so? Has the gospel gotten to the Gentiles? Let's read about it. Now those who were scattered. After the persecution that arose over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but Jews only. But some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists. So now these men, these, these, these men from Cyprus, who else is from Cyprus? Uh, Barnabas, remember? And, and from Cyrene, they were preaching to the Hellenists, this were, these were the Greeks. These were those who followed the, uh, the way of the Greek philosophy and the Greek you know, mythology. And, but they began to preach to these men and women. And the Bible says, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. 
Then news of these things came into the ear of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. And when he came and seen the grace of God, listen to this, when he came, he saw that God was working, that this was God, and that, yes, indeed, Gentiles were coming to know Christ. The Bible says that he was mad. No way. Not the dogs. No, the Bible says he was glad. You know, um, I've been rocking with Kanye lately, you know, his new CD. <laughs> and, one, and one of his songs, you know, he's talking about how he reached out to Christians when he was beginning his journey of faith. He said they were the first to hate on him. They were the first not to receive him. Should never be the case, y'all. Should never be the case for us. Kanye, if you hear this by chance, I would be happy to try to help you in your discipleship. You know? Um, but anyways, so Barnabas gets there, and he sees the grace of God. He sees these people who were outside looking in before are now in the family. You know, one thing about being a Christian we don't get, and, and about being a human, you don't get to choose your family. <laughs> well, you should love them. And so now he sees the grace of God, and he's, he was glad, and the Bible says, and he did what he always does. He encouraged them that with all purpose, that with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. And why did he do these things? Why was Barnabas who he was? I want you to understand. Look what the Bible says. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. It all boils down that Barnabas was a man who walked in the spirit. He was a man full of faith. That's the kind of man God uses. Man, I just want to encourage you. This is a plug again, once again, for resurgence. Man, we've got to step up. Statistics show that uh, the churches today are primarily, uh, are, 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 their servants within the church are primarily women. It's true here. There are more women who serve. I would say the number is four to one. Um, there's so many men who have been derelict in their spiritual leadership of their homes and in the body of Christ. Statistics show that men take their faith less serious than women, that they're more less disciplined when it comes to spiritual things. And, and that ought not be so. I love the fact that Barnabas was a man's man and that he was willing to serve God with grace. I mean, we got to step it up. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And, many, and a great many people were added to the Lord. God used his life to bring others to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. First three questions of our test. Are we consistently serving the body of Christ? Are we contributors or consumers? Are we discipling someone? Are, are we pouring into someone along the way? Barnabas, he did. I want you to see the last question this morning. Are we personally involved in the mission of the church? Are we personally involved in the mission of the church? You say, Pastor Abram, what is the mission of the church? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the mission of the church is the Great Commission to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. You see, God, the reason why he doesn't beam us up when we get saved is because there's still a mission to be accomplished. The early church, they understood a little better than I think we do that there are, is a mission. We've been given orders from our general, the Lord Jesus Christ, to preach the gospel to every creature, to tell everyone about a savior, if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, we want to share with you the good news that Jesus loves you. He loved you so much and he loved the world so much that he went to a cross and he shed his royal red, sinless, perfect blood to cover your sins and my sin. And that not only did he die for our sins, but three days later, he rose from the grave to prove that he is, in fact, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And he calls out and he reaches out to all who will hear. And he says, I will save you. 
I will forgive you. I will give you eternal life. All you have to do is receive the gift. It's a free gift because it's already been purchased. And this morning, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you know what made the difference in Barnabas' life? It was the fact that he came to know Jesus. And Jesus, of course, uh, took over his life. And, and now he was a servant of the Most High. And may I say this morning, that should be the, the, the calling letters for everyone in this room. We serve Jesus. Amen. He was personally involved in the mission of the church. I want you to see it. Go to Acts 13, a few chapters over. Acts 13, verse, verse 1. Now, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they were sent away. So Barnabas and Saul, they were sent out on the first missionary journey. They were going to go to Asia Minor with the gospel. They were going to go preach to Jews and Gentiles alike. And God separated them out of the local church, that, that thriving church in Antioch, to go to tell others about him. And I hope you guys understand that God doesn't just want us all at the table he may call some of us to go, to go to people who have not heard of Jesus. You know, in our day, there are people who have not heard a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we should be willing, if God says, like he did here in Acts 13, to go, to be sent out. But I find it very telling that it was Saul and Barnabas who were sent out because these were people who were already serving. I find this, God rarely, I, I, I would say never, calls anyone who is idle uh, into the, the, the deeper work. And God wants to use every one of us, but we've got to be busy where he has us now. You remember Barnabas, he began to serve before he was in any official, endo official endorsed ministry. And so he was involved in the mission of the church. They began to go out and share the gospel. There was persecution. There was hard times. But Barnabas and Saul, they were faithful if you read uh, the book of Acts, which I would suggest you do as a believer, you will see that there took, a, there took place a transition. Up until this point, Barnabas was out front. Barnabas was the one leading. He was the one discipling. Remember, he was the one pouring into Saul. But at some point, Saul's name got changed to Paul. And God put him as his chosen vessel out front of Barnabas. Now, do we hear any complaints from Barnabas? He gladly went in the back seat to support the, God's man. Uh, I'll never forget, I was in college and, um, well, I was just graduating high school when I was um, able to, to try out for uh, Antelope Valley College basketball team. And uh, I remember begging my coach, because I, I was not invited formally, it was my, uh, my best friend. Carlton, he was invited to come try out for the team, but I, I had a lesser role on the high school team, and, and uh, so I wasn't invited, but I begged my coach, like, let me, just, uh, let me just sneak over there and try out, you know, and so finally my coach, he, he let me go, and I'll never forget going to that, that tryout, and uh, the first day I was maxed up with the starting point guard, his name is Mike. I'll, I'll be forever grateful to Mike because I have a wife because of Mike this morning. He hooked me up with my wife. But anyways, <laughs> so, so many good things happened from me getting to that, yeah, to this practice. But anyways, I went to this tryout and, and uh, sure enough, I was maxed up with Mike. He was the stud from the, you know, coming into his second year there, one of the leading scorers on the team. And I, I knew that I had one opportunities to make a good impression. <laughs> and so that practice, I, I, I went 100%, 110% the whole practice, and God blessed me, and, and I, 
I impressed the coach. And so he invited me back. And long story short, uh, I made the team and we began to um, travel for our spring league. I got to play uh, in college before I graduated high school. And so it was such a, a fun thing. Anyways, uh, I remember going through that summer just excited about the season. You know, I was going to be a starter. I began to start on the team in that spring league. And and I was excited, you know, my dreams were coming true. I, anyone who knows me from back then, basketball was my life. And so, anyhow, I'll never forget one day we were, we were playing, and there's this guy who came into the gym. And uh, he was about 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, and he, you could tell he was, he was just chiseled. And he came in the gym, and he, he started to play. And, um, and it was just evident he was better than everybody else in the gym. You ever been around an athlete like that? Just superior. His name was Wendell, and, and he, I, I went up to him after the, the pickup game, and I said, hey, hey, where do you play? You know, where are you? He's like, I'm coming here. I said, oh. <laughs> I said, what position do you play? He's like, I'm a two guard. I was like, oh. Which I was right. Uh, I ended up sitting next to the coach a lot that year. Uh, <laughs> He was, he was a phenomenal athlete. Um, we won, I think, six of the seven preseason tournaments. I mean, he averaged 25 points a game. I mean, every, every day, every game, he was putting somebody on a poster. He was dunking on somebody. And, and we had scouts from the Chicago Bulls coming out to our practices. We had scouts from the Detroit Pistons, every D1 program, Duke, Kansas. Bill Self came out. I remember just, just this guy, was, he was special. Um, he ended up going to UNLV. He didn't quite make it in the NBA, but that just goes to show me, you know, just the level of, of play at that level. But anyways, it was best for the team <laughs> that I sit down and that Wendell play. And for, at the beginning, I griped about that. I was not happy about that, my reduced role. But when I bought in and I just learned that, I, you know, I needed to be a good player in practice and, and, and just help my team when, when called upon, uh, we were successful, and I enjoyed it. And let me tell you this, guys. The same is for the body of Christ. There may be somebody who gotten saved after you, but God elevates and puts in a position, and uh, you let God be the de decider on that, and you be thankful that we're on the team, and you play. Uh, we play our role the best that we can. This is who Barnabas was. He was a man who was about the mission. Do you understand that the the mission is bigger than the individual. People in our world, our children, are, are looking for something, for us to pass on something to them worth dying for. And the gospel is worth that. I tell my kids and I pray over them that they would be willing to take risks for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That they'd be willing to hazard their, even, even their lives for the glory of Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying being reckless and doing things just to attract attention to, to get into trouble. But I'm saying this, if God says for you to go uh, over to South Central LA to, to plant a church and you do it and trust him. And so this is who Barnabas was. He was about the mission of the church. He was an encourager. He was a discipler. He was a servant leader. He was about the mission of the church. He was a giver. This morning, the Barnabas test. How are we doing? What, what grade did we get this morning? Could we answer? Now, these questions aren't multiple choices. It's either yes or no. <laughs> They're not. Yes or no. And maybe you're, you're here saying, man, I didn't do good, too good on that test. And, and if you're new, you're, you're just coming. And I'm not, I'm not trying to put guilt on you, but I'm, I am saying that. You have a purpose here. If you've been here for a while and you're just kind of idle, the Bible says to warn those who are idle. Jesus said, the night cometh when no man can work. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Oh, what a better, there's not a, been a better time to be a part of a, a thriving church than today when the darkness seems to be uh, getting even darker but you guys understand that the brighter, the darker the night, the brighter the light shines. And Jesus has called us to be salt and light in this generation. And it starts with the body. It starts at home. 
My mom used to always say, charity starts at home. This is home. Amen. Jesus said, I'll know your mind by the way you love one another. This is with Barnabas. That's where he started, right? He started encouraging those in the body. And then, of course, God sent him out. The Barnabas test. How are we doing? 